by them in the order that they happened and you get this general rotation matrix for this set of two rotations uh, at the bottom of this slide. Now why is order important? Why, why can't we just do it in any old order? Well, we'll just do a simple little illustration of, of why order is particularly important. So if we were to do these two rotations, it's quite simple, we're still just doing two, uh, but did them in the opposite direction. So if we rotated by, rotated by theta around the z-axis first, and then rotated by phi about the updated y-axis, so this, these are the original rotations but in the reverse order, uh, this is what you'd get. So you start in the diagram at the bottom left, uh, rotating by theta around the z-axis. Uh, we've got the updated axis uh, in the middle of the, di middle of the slide, uh, and then we rotate by phi around the y-axis. Uh, I've chosen angles of about 90 degrees once again just to make things uh, nice and clear. And this is the end axis we end up with. Uh, so this is what we end up with if we do the rotations in the opposite uh, order. If we compare what we ended up with after the two rotations, doing them in, in the op opposite orders, we find out that the axes are, are very, very different. Um, they don't match up at all. Uh, so this shows that you really need to pay attention to the, the order in which you do the rotations. The second way that you might define your, your rotations might be to define all your rotations about your initial uh, fixed reference frame. So rather than, than updating your reference frame after each rotation, you define all your rotations based on the original reference frame zero. Uh, so the terminology is the same. We've got uh, R subscript one, superscript zero, uh, and so on. And these are the rotations from frame to frame, but they're defined always in the original reference frame zero. And this changes uh, how we do the math. So we know that uh, the, the rotation matrix relating uh, reference frame two and reference frame zero, uh, when we're using uh, updated current reference frames, so the, the first um, process we just went through, uh, is just uh, the ordered sequence of rotations multiplied by each other. But in this, this current fixed frame situation, uh, we need to define everything in terms of the original reference frame zero. Uh, so we have from our similarity transform a few slides ago, uh, we can write that the, the rotation relating frames one and two is the inverse of the rotation matrix relating frames zero and one times uh, whatever our transform is, uh, defined in the fixed original frame multiplied by our rotation matrix relating frames zero and one. Uh, and with a little bit of algebraic manipulation, uh, we get that our total transformation is the rotation R, this is uh, whatever our transform is defined in the original reference frame times the rotation matrix relating frames zero and one. So the, the message that you pull out of this is that when you define all your rotations in terms of a fixed reference frame, uh, you need to do your rotations in the opposite order that they occur. So you pre-multiply by your uh, later rotations rather than post-multiplying. So the, the multiplications occur in the opposite order. So to verify this, uh, we, can, we can check whether uh, two sets of rotations, one defined in fixed frame coordinates and one defined in current frame coordinates are the same. Uh, so the first situation, uh, fixed frame, is uh, a rotation of 90 degrees around the Z0 axis and then a rotation of 90 degrees about the Y0 axis. So this is in fixed frame. So everything's defined in terms of the, the reference frame 0 axes. This is equivalent, or we're going to check it, to a moving frame uh, set of rotations, except that the, the moving or current frame set of rotations are first a rotation of 90 degrees about Z0. The first rotation is the same because nothing's happened yet. And then a 90 degree rotation about the X subscript one axis. Uh, so that's the difference because we're updating our axes after each rotation. Uh, so that's why that second rotation is different. So in the fixed frame case, which is the, the top line we've worked out here, uh, we said that we first had a rotation of 
90 degrees around the z-axis and then a rotation of 90 degrees around the y-axis. But because this is a fixed frame uh, situation, we do the multiplications in the opposite order. So the first rotation matrix is actually the rotation around the y-axis matrix and the second rotation matrix is the rotation around the z-axis. Uh, so you can see that this is in the opposite order that they're defined in the statement. Uh, we do the math and we get a, a matrix out at the end. The second line shows the current frame situation. So this is uh, where we rotate 90 degrees around the z-axis first and then 90 degrees around the x-axis. And because this is a, a moving or current frame technique, uh, we do these multiplications in the order that they occurred. Uh, put the numbers into the, the matrices uh, and we get out a matrix at the end. Uh, and you can see that these two uh, methods are equivalent uh, for these two transformations. And what you may want to do is go and, and draw these two um, sets of axes and draw them after each transformation and, and confirm visually that this is so. Uh, there's a number of standard ways of describing rotations. We won't actually do most of these in this course. Um, Euler angles are a current or moving reference frame uh, technique where you define a set of three rotations, uh, the, first around around, the first around the z-axis, the second around the updated y-axis, and the third around the then updated again uh, z-axis. Uh, there's your standard roll, pitch, and yaw. Uh, you may, if you're into aeros aerospace, you be pr pretty familiar with roll, pitch, and yaw. So this is a fixed frame technique. You define everything in terms of your original reference frame. So rotations around x, y, and z in your original reference frame. There's an axis angle representation where you define a, a unit vector, which is your angle of rotation, uh, and then you give an angle that you'd like to rotate around uh, that unit vector. And then there's quaternions as well, which we I don't think we'll get into in this course. So that's a, a Euler example here. You have your sequence of rotations. Uh, because it's in the current or moving reference frame, you do them in the order uh, that they occurred, and uh, that's what's done on this slide. Now, roll, pitch, and yaw, you can define actually around either a, a fixed frame or around the current frames. Uh, this is just one particular example multiplied out here. So what we've looked at so far is exclusively uh, pretty much just rotations. Uh, but we know that we can have, we can have multiple rotations uh, and we can also have uh, translations or displacements between reference frames. For instance, uh, when you have a, a robot arm which is say two meters long, there's a displacement of two meters along a particular axis. Uh, so we can get around this problem mathematically by using homogeneous transformations. Uh, and these are simply just uh, elegant ways of forming uh, your transformation matrices. So they do everything at the same time. They do both rotation and displacement all in one calculation. Uh, homogeneous transformations, uh, we use a H to represent these matrices. Uh, and the general form is shown in the top little matrix, which is you have the, the parts of the matrix which do rotation at the top left. You have the parts of the matrix that do uh, displacements or translations at the top right. Uh, and then you have an extra row at the bottom, uh, which ends in a one. And I've expanded on this uh, in the bottom slide. Now, one of the other things you have to do uh, a little bit differently when you're working with homogeneous transformations uh, is you need to add an extra element to all your uh, vectors and positions. Normally in 3D, these, the, these vectors uh, and positions have three elements. What you need to do is add an extra one at the end of it uh, in order to make it so you can multiply them by the homogeneous transformations. Uh, so in this case, we've added a one to our position vector P uh, and now you can see that the matrix multiplication uh, works out quite nicely. Uh, and this, the form of this mirrors very much what we did with our 3D rotation matrices. Uh, if you want to work out where point P, which we already know in reference frame 1 is, if we want to work out where that's located within reference frame 0, we multiply it by the homogeneous transformation relating reference frames 0 and 1. So let's do an example of, of how to form a homogeneous uh, transformation. Uh, so this is, let's rotate 90 degrees around the z-axis 
but also chuck in a displacement of three units in the y zero axis direction. So in the original uh, axis direction. Uh, and I've represented that schematically here. For simple cases like this, uh, it's very easy. First, we work out in isolation what the rotation matrix is. So it's a rotation of 90 degrees around the z-axis. You go look up the, the, ro the general rotation matrix and you sub in uh, 90 degrees and you get the, the R matrix I've listed here. Uh, you also have a, a displacement array, which is all the displacements in the original axis directions, so in the x0, y0, and z0 directions. In this case, we have a displacement of three units in the y0 direction, so our displacement array is 0, 3, 0. Uh, and then we can just chuck them into our homogeneous transformation matrix uh, side by side, add in the, the row of zeros ending in a 1 at the bottom, and that's our general homogeneous transformation matrix. Now, what we can also do is test it out. Uh, so this is our homogeneous transformation relating reference frame 0 and 1. Uh, what we can do is see if we can convert a point uh, defined in reference frame 1 into reference frame 0 coordinates. So using the uh, standard form, which is uh, the, the H transformation matrix times P superscript 1, uh, we sub in our numbers, uh, our P matrix is, our P array is uh, 1, 0, 0, uh, and then with the 1 at the end to make it, to make the math work. Uh, and we do the multiplication and we get that in reference frame 0, uh, P is located at 0, 4, 0. So it's located 4 units along the Y, 0 axis. Uh, like rotation matrices, sometimes we want to go in the opposite direction. So rather than going from uh, a point in reference frame 1 and converting it into a location in reference frame 0, uh, we might want to change a or go from a location in reference frame 0 and convert it into coordinates in reference frame 1. Uh, and we can invert the H matrix, just like we could invert the rotation matrix before. Uh, and there's a handy little shortcut uh, based on, on how the math works, uh, which is your inverse homogeneous transform uh, is made up of the transpose of the rotation matrix, uh, the negative of the transpose of the rotation matrix times your displacement uh, vector, and 0 and 1. Or how, and that bottom row, remember, will be however many zeros you need, uh, usually 3, uh, followed by a 1. Uh, and we can check that this works by trying to go in the opposite direction in our coordinate transforms. So let's see if we can go from a point defined in reference frame 0 uh, back to a point in reference frame 1. So here we have here we have the math laid out. So our original homogeneous transformation we've got, we already know. Uh, but we're going to need um, our inverse homogeneous transform uh, in order to convert our coordinates back in the opposite direction. Uh, so we transpose the, the R part of the original matrix and remember that the R part is the the 3x3 three three matrix in the top left of the original homogeneous transformation. Uh, so you transpose that. Uh, to work out the new uh, D matrix you have to multiply the original D component. The original D component is 0, 3, 0. Uh, and multiply this by the negative of the transpose of the rotation matrix. Uh, and then put this all together again, and we get our inverse homogeneous transformation matrix. Uh, and then we can then multiply P superscript 0 by it in order to get P superscript 1. And that's what happens in the bottom line, uh, and we get back to our original set of coordinates, which is the point P defined in reference frame 1 is located at 1, 0, 0. Ah, so we've just done it in reverse uh, and got back to where we started.